Dr. Mark Goulston, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Well, thank you for having me on it. There are so many things that we could talk about. You know, I was going through your bio, through your LinkedIn, your YouTube channel, um, you know, from working with, with parents um, to help their teens, um, you know, be mentally healthy and to prevent suicide, from teaching people how to be better listeners, from a, uh, a role in the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, and I, I really didn't know where we were going to go. But just before we started recording, you made an offer that I jumped on, which was to talk about the, the first line of your LinkedIn bio, which is you're the world leading expert on healthy conflict. And I, let's let's start there. And maybe before we go into healthy conflict, let's let's find out a little bit about you and, and your your journey and your bona fides so people know who they're who's talking to them. Great. Thank you, Howie. So a little of my background and most people have a backstory to what they're doing and it kind of explains what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, my backstory is at least part of my backstory is I dropped out of medical school twice and finished. And huh. I dropped out, I think for untreated depression. And so the first time I took a leave of absence and then I went and worked in some blue collar jobs and my mind came back to me at a blue collar level. And I love the people I met in those blue collar jobs. I, I, I dream about it. I romanticize it because life was so simple and direct and straightforward. And then I came back and within a couple of months, my mind uh, got depressed again and the school wanted to kick me out uh, because they were losing matching funds. And I met with the dean of the school, a good guy, but he uh, wanted to know what was going on with me. And I don't remember that meeting, but then I got a call from the dean of students who cares about students more than he cares about funding. Uh, the main dean, hmm. you know, uh, uh, was there, he cared more about funding the school. And so the Dean of Students called me and said, you better come in here. I have a letter from the main dean. And I go in there and I read the letter. And the letter says, I met with Mr. Goulston. I wasn't a doctor then. We talked about a different career. And I'm advising the promotions committee that he be asked to withdraw. And I said to the Dean of Students, hmm. um, what does this mean? And I was at a low point, Howie. He said, you've been kicked out. And I kind of cratered in front of him. I mean, I, I, I literally folded over. I felt something wet on my cheekbones and I kept touching them and looking at my fingers. And I thought I was bleeding, not that it's a religious or spiritual moment, but I just kept looking at my hands and they were wet from tears. And I came from a background with parents uh, who would, you know, grew up in the depression and you were only worth what you could do in life. You know, that was not that unusual mm. for, for people of my parents' generation. And I was at a point where I didn't think I could do much. And, um, and this is what he said to me. Uh, well, actually, he said the following, which I now realize is something I call the trifecta of hope. The trifecta of hope, because it was something that I uh, paid forward uh, in my career, but I'll get to that in a second. He said to me, um, when he saw my raw vulnerability, he said, you didn't mess up because you're passing everything, but you are messed up. But if you hmm. get uh, unmessed up, I think the school would be glad they gave you a second chance. And then here's the first leg of the trifecta of hope. He said, even if you don't get unmessed up, even if you don't become a doctor, even if you don't do anything with the rest of your life, I'd be proud to know you. So that was like unconditional hmm. love. And I went, what? And then, he, and, and then here's the second uh, leg of it. He said, uh, you have something in you. This, this streak of goodness, you don't know you have it. Uh, and we don't grade that. We should, but we don't. And you have it. 
and you don't know how much the world needs that and you won't need it. You won't know it until you're 35, but you have to make it to your 35. So the second leg of the trifecta of hope. So there was unconditional love. And then he saw a future for me that I didn't see, you know, uh, the, uh, the world uh, needs what you have, Mark, and you don't have to do anything. You just have to be you. And then the third thing is he said, uh, uh, he pointed at me and he said, but you have to make it till you're 35. You deserve to be on this planet and you're going to let me help you. So the third leg is he stood up to the medical school and the main dean and said, we're giving this one a second chance. So unconditional mm. uh, valuing something in me that I didn't have to perform uh, to, to get a future that I didn't see. And that person putting themselves at risk. He was just a PhD standing up to this promotions committee of all MDs. So something flipped inside me. And so I got that second year off and I worked at a place called the Menninger Foundation, which is still around. It's now in Houston, but it was based in Topeka, Kansas. And it's a psychiatric foundation with uh, multiple hospitals. And I discovered that I had a knack. I mean, I, I, I grew up outside of Boston and here I was speaking with schizophrenic farm adults and and I could sort of get through to them. And so I remember asking the psychiatrist, is this legitimate? <laughs> you know, this is different than med school. And they said, no, it's, mm. le it, it, it's legitimate and you've got a gift. So I, I held on to that for dear life, Howie, and I finished that year off. And then I came back, finished med school, went to UCLA, trained in psychiatry, and then after I finished training, one of my early mentors was one of the top pioneers in suicide prevention. And so I went out into practice and I saw a fair amount of suicidal patients and none of them died by suicide in 30 years. And I just paid it forward, Howie. I just, I just did onto them what was done onto me. I, I saw some value in them that they couldn't see. Uh, I remember I asked one person, what helps? You know, you know, what works here? I'm trying to figure this out. And he said, what you don't realize is I'm a burden to the world. You know, I scare my parents. I tick off my brother and sister. They think I'm manipulative, which I am. You know, nothing in life feels great to me. So my life's a burden to me. So I just think about why don't I just relieve everyone of my being a burden? But when I came to see you, you had this smile and I thought you were crazy. Why would you smile to see me? And I realized mm. I, was, I wasn't a burden to you. I mean, you, you know, you were professional, but you weren't just focused on, let's see how your treatment's going. Are you following through on such and such? You, would, you just seemed to be glad to see me, and nobody was. <laughs> and I went, wow, that's, mm. that's pretty interesting. So I know that's a longer answer than you wanted, but uh, I couldn't stop myself, Howie. <laughs> mm. Well, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And, you know, what, one of the things that strikes me is, you know, clearly the dean of students was right to see in you what you couldn't see in yourself. But also, the, you know, it's unclear to me from the story, and maybe it's clear or unclear to you, whether the dean of students was saying that because of what they saw in you or because of who they were, that they know that everyone, it's true for everyone, that everyone mm -hmm. is deserving of unconditional love, everyone has a future, and everyone is worth taking some degree of risk for if they see the person is going to reciprocate. So it's almost like, the story is both somebody saw that you're special and somebody saw that you are just like everybody else. That is so true because what happened is after I finished uh, my training in psychiatry and after I was in practice for several years, I uh, went back to Boston and had lunch with the Dean of Students. And I said, why did you do that for me? 
why did you stand up for me? And it's exactly what you said. He said, uh, someone did it for me 30 years ago. Huh. So it's a, it's like a pay it forward kind of thing. And, uh, uh, I'll share something that's a little bit of a tangent, but you know, this is conversational. Uh, I, I'm retired now and I'm doing a bunch of things and I'm trying to sort of scale what I know and teach people what I know and hopefully it'll help them to help others. But uh, when I used to see depressed patients and I would drill down into them with something I call surgical empathy. Uh, and, mm. and surgical empathy is a way of just going in deeper and deeper. And one of the approaches there is the five realies. What's really going on? Well, you know, I, you know, I don't feel motivated and such and such. Yeah, I understand that. But what's really going on? And when you get to the fourth or mm. fifth really, a number of my depressed patients would say, I don't deserve to be happy because I am totally focused on myself. I don't care about anyone. Mm. All I, I'm just self-absorbed. And so why would someone like me deserve to be happy? Uh, and so one of the things I started doing is I started giving them a, a box of healthy snacks in little bags. And I said, every day, if you see a homeless person, which you do in Los Angeles, I want you to walk up to them, mm. uh, Always have some of these snacks in your pocket. Uh, reach in and have one with your hand outstretched because you don't want to scare the homeless person by reaching into your pocket. And go up to them and mm. say, hi, hi, my name's Mark. What's your name? And you may be surprised to know that homeless people have names. They're people. And, you know, and they may be a little nervous. And... Maybe they'll tell you the name, maybe they won't. And then with your outstretched hand, give them a healthy snack because you might be hesitant to give them money because you're worried they'll buy alcohol or drugs. And then look them in the eye, give them the healthy snack and say, here, I hope this helps. And just hang in there. And then make eye contact mm -hmm. and leave. And so I would do this with depressed, some of my depressed patients who had said that they felt they were totally self-absorbed. And they'd come back the next week and I'd say, so how did it go? And they would look at me begrudgingly and say, it helped. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, in fact, the, the last statement is like the, the fact that that while people are, are desperate for help, very often we, we wear our pain like our clothes and it feel, you know, to take it off, to say, you know, to be like, you'd think someone would come in overjoyed, like, yeah, this helped. But we, I, I felt it in myself that I, I'm grudging when something works and I feel better. It's like, what, like, why do I want to hold on to that dirty, tattered, stinking piece of clothing that's not protecting me, that's actually pushing me, pushing people away. But, but yet, there's something comforting about my dysfunction that I don't want to give up. Well, I, I think this is really interesting what you're saying, because uh, uh, I had mentioned earlier a word surgical empathy, and it's a word that I uh, yeah. use yeah. to describe an approach I take uh, because when people are very suicidal and they're suicidal because they've had, they've frequently had, at least from their point of view, multiple traumas. And when people f have multiple traumas, they form psychological adhesions, not attachments, but psychological adhesions to death as a way to take the pain away. It's kind of like the sirens calling out to the sailors, I'll take your pain away, just you know, sail on the rocks here. And they form this adhesion mm. And if they've been suicidal more than a few times in their life, they still tuck it in their back pocket. They don't talk about it because they don't want to scare people. But what they think is, worse comes to worse, I can always kill myself. And it's an adhesion. Mm. And it's like an adhesion after a surgery, you sometimes have to go in there and sever the adhesion. And what surgical empathy does is, is it goes in and it causes the other person to feel felt and valued 
and not judged and seen and heard. And when people experience that, they will often grab onto it. In fact, something I learned from the a mentor of mine, Dr. Ed Schneidman, he's a, a psychologist who's one of the pioneers in suicide prevention, is when I started seeing suicidal patients, uh, yes, I would listen for the usual things. I mean, I, you know, I, I, in, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of what the diagnosis is, but I pivoted to listening for hurt, fear that they couldn't take the hurt much longer, anger at how the world was reacting to their hurt and fear because the world was saying, well, we'll, we'll just exercise more or just take your pills. Did you take your pills? Mm -hmm. So I would listen for hurt, fear, anger, and how much time they had before they did something destructive and how we, it was always there. And when they could feel that, they would sometimes grab onto that they'd feel felt and they'd start to cry with relief. And, and, and the crying was the beginning to use, you know, one of the words you use for your show, it began a healing inside them. Does that make sense? So it does and it doesn't to me. It, in terms of like, I, you know, when I would think about it before this conversation, I would say, of course, people who are suicidal feel hurt, fear and anger, and they're aware of it already. What what is it? Maybe there's, you know, we can kind of say what suicide, what um, um, surgical empathy like looks like or feels like. Maybe, we, you know, you could describe it or we could demo it in some way. But I'm, I'm curious, like what? What changed in that between their conscious awareness of these, you know, unwanted emotional states and when they were able to cry in acknowledgement of being seen and connected to another person and, and worthy of life? So I'll give you an example of it and I'll demonstrate the difference between, you know, you know, clinical and professional empathy, maybe it's not empathy, and surgical empathy. Uh, before I do that, one of the things that I observed with suicidal patients is that, uh, and I wrote an article after Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade died by suicide, and it had 400,000 views in two weeks in the article, which is still up on Medium. It says, why people kill themselves, it's not depression. So obviously that's, that's what grabbed mm. people's attention. And I said, um, there's hundreds of millions of people who are depressed, maybe billions, who don't kill themselves. There's people who lose their job who don't kill themselves. There's people who lose their marriage who don't kill themselves. It may contribute to it, but, uh, uh, but one of the things that I noticed in nearly all the suicidal patients was despair. And if you break the word despair into DES, P A I R des pair, it means unpaired, hopeless, unpaired with a future, helpless, powerless, unpaired with the ability to get out, worthless, useless, meaningless, purposeless, and when they all line up, pointless. So the so mm. the, they feel unpaired with reasons to live. And, uh, and they pair with death to take the pain away. But if they compare with you, emotionally, empathically, uh, surgically, empathically, they may let go of death as the way out and just feel felt. Uh, to be honest, uh, this is a whole other different interview. Um, uh, uh, there's something I, I'm thinking of writing called the untrip. How to get the benefits of psychedelics without taking them. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that psychedelics, now you can uh, push back and tell me, but one of the things that when I've talked to people who have done psychedelics and uh, uh, one of the things that nearly all of them say is, 
I lost control. I gave up control. I surrendered control. But one of the reasons I took the psychedelics is that having to be in control was not my friend. It wasn't working for me anymore. And mm -hmm. I was just, I was just tightly wound and, you know, I couldn't relax and I was just uptight. And the psychedelics gave me a therapeutic psychosis. And with the help of a shaman or a therapist who said, yeah, throwing up is okay. Uh, diarrhea is okay. It's all part of it. What's happening is your mind is becoming sort of, uh, uncoupled. It's, it's deconfiguring and just be patient and it will reconfigure. One of the metaphors that someone used, which I think is a great metaphor, they said it was like having a puddle of mercury and someone just smashed it and the mercury splintered into all these little mercury droplets. But then uh, with the patience and, uh, uh, and help of a shaman or a therapist, those little mercury drops started coming back and clicking together. And by the end of it, what happened is uh, the person who used this metaphor, which I think was wonderful, is they say, by the end, the mercury puddle had reconstituted itself, but it was different than the mercury puddle when I walked in. I mean, I was, I was relaxed. Mm. I didn't have, I wasn't so uptight. So, so, so if you follow what I'm saying, I think surrendering control, uh, when having to be in control isn't serving you is a helpful thing, but a lot of people cannot surrender control. They, they feel out of control. They, uh, it, it causes too much anxiety and the psychedelics uh, help them do that. And again, if you're listening in, it's not for everyone. Uh, you know, you have to really screen carefully because there are some people who have a thought disorder like schizophrenia. And so breaking them apart um, uh, with psychedelics may uh, may not be a good idea. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking back to uh, my my own alleged psychedelic experiences, which I may or may not have had, <laughs> depending on how legal they were. Um, there's yeah, so I'm thinking. Um, I think control for, for me, control and from people that I've talked to and practitioners, I think there is a, a huge element of not, it wasn't that there was no control, but that, oh, I'm a passenger. <laughs> I don't have to be the driver. Like right. it wasn't like, oh, this, the, the vehicle is just going wherever. It's like, oh, there is, there is an intelligence. There is a connection. Um, Right. So, the, you know, the 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 language I've heard is sort of the, the big snowfall mm -hmm. comes in and um, co covers the tracks of all the, the you know, ruminations and perseverations and allows me to choose anew. Um, but I'm real curious about where you started with, which is how to do this without psychedelics, because there's, you know, there's a lot of hurdles to getting high quality psychedelics to finding someone who is in integrity and trustworthy. Um, you know, I know of people in the coaching community who are kind of presenting psychedelics almost as another, you know, as a coaching tool. And I, and many of them, as I look, I, I doubt their integrity. I doubt their, their capability. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. So, you know, so, let me give you an example yeah. that you can apply to your life and your viewers and listeners can apply to their life. Um, uh, I, I was blessed. I had eight mentors. They all died. Uh, the last one was Larry King. So I used to go to breakfast with him every morning with this quirky group of people in Los Angeles. And Larry was one of the most curious people in the world. Uh, and uh, hmm. If you watch his interviews, he's just curious. Uh, he, uh, some people said, you know, he was a little bit too soft, but he wasn't there to hit you with a gotcha. But he, but he would be curious. Mm -hmm. You could be a serial killer, and, and and he'd say, "What made you do that?" With no judgment, 
and uh, and people would open up. Mm. And one of the things, uh, a quote uh, that I attribute to him is he said, you know, Mark, you can't be furious and curious at the same moment. Because <laughs> curiosity is a sensory modality. You're curious. You're sensing something. Furious is you're right on the brink of an impulse of getting angry at someone. So here's something you and your listeners can apply. Uh, and you can nip a lot of conflicts and con uh, and, and uh, conversations that are going sideways in the bud. Uh, and it's a simple tactic. And, and it's this, uh, when things are picking up between you and another person, and they're going in a bad direction, if you can, instead of trading tit for tat, you pause and ask yourself, what's it like for the other person right now? And you let mm. go of anything you're thinking, any agenda, any need to be right. And you just pause and say, what's it like for them right now? I did this with my wife about 30 years ago. We've been married 44 years. And uh, I really lucked out with her. Uh, and But some years ago, and we can still get into these tit for tat squabbles. You did this. Well, you did this. Blah, 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 blah. And it goes nowhere good. And I remember years ago, <laughs> we got into one of those. and uh, And rather than loading up with my next volley, I said to myself, what's it like for her right now? And I thought, I don't think, I don't think she likes what's happening because it always ends with, you know, we're negative and then we have to sort of gently walk back to each other and sort of let it go. Um, and we don't necessarily follow all the steps that you should to resolve conflicts, you know, uh, because, you know, uh, part of what I love about my wife is she'll say, don't try any of that psychological BS on me. <laughs> so I, I kind of like that about <laughs> her, you know, because you know, there's a part of me that thinks there's a lot of BS in our profession. So so there we are. We're having this argument. And instead of laying into her again, I said, uh, do you like where this is going? She said, what? I said, do you know, do you like where this is going? Because where it usually goes is you'll say something, I'll say something. And then one of us will say, okay, that's enough. And then, uh, and it's usually me who sleeps in the den. Uh, I, I don't know why you always get to sleep in the bedroom and I get to sleep in the den, but you know, that seems to be how we do it. And I said, do you like where this is going? She said, no, I, I can't stand this. Uh, I can't stand when we get into this. And I looked at her and I said, do you have any, do you have any idea how we can keep it from going there? And because I gave up control and having to be right, she smiled at me and she said, no, but you're doing really good. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, you find it's, it's, the parallels, there's ways that we can do that in our life. Yeah. And I'm, I'm struck by when you, you spoke of, furious as, you know, the cusp of an impulse, because like for, for me, I've been working with um, with a guy, a counselor to kind of help me with some conflicts in my life. And as I, I, I take notes at the, at the end of the session, just things to remember. And then I go off and I try to, you know, try to be a better person in the real world. And I can't figure out how to do it in the moment. And I keep coming back to the notes and they, every single note is always the same thing. It's always saying, hey, what's going on for you right now? Can we slow down? And it's like that, those words, which are so simple, like I should get a tattoo, like, uh, you know, Guy Pearson memento, just to have them because the impulse to do something else which is the same as the impulse I feel about junk food or watching another Netflix show or scrolling Instagram, the, the impulse to make myself feel okay in the moment kind of blocks the part of my brain that even has access to this wisdom. And I'm, I'm wondering how can we, how can I um, sort of train? So like, you know, shooting free throws so that in the game I can sink the basket and not immediately give in to the furious impulse to protect myself rather than be curious. 
So I'm glad you asked because I'm going to give you a tactic that I hope will be helpful. Um, w- one of the reasons on LinkedIn I've identified myself as a healthy conflict coach is I, I don't do conflict resolution anymore between parties because uh, we might resolve one conflict, but the bully gets to live to bully again and the bullied gets to be bullied again. And so I just don't do that. Uh, what I what I prefer to do is I work with executives or CEOs who aren't good with conflict. They either get angry or they avoid it or they dump it on someone else or they shut down. And so here's my tactic for you. Realize if conflict is so universal and people think it's universally bad, they think it's universally bad because they've had a lot of conflicts that didn't, in the, at least in the moment, uh, end up happily. So if, if you can do this mm-hmm. tweak in your mind, and here's the tweak, it's a mindset shift. Uh, and when I coach people on this, first of all, identify I'm in a conflict, I'm getting agitated. And then when I coach people, I say, I want you to hear my voice or the voice of a mentor or the voice of someone saying, Howie, opportunity for poise, opportunity for growth. Uh, Hmm. And what I advise my uh, my clients to do, and when they smile and they say, well, that's easy to say, I say, no, but what you're going to do is after you hear me say that, in your mind, I want you to lash out at me. I want you to say, F you, Mark. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have poise. I don't want to grow. I want to get <laughs> even. I want to eat that whole. And, and so I want you to imagine me uh, taking the hit. I want you to do a rope a dope on me, you know, uh, uh, and just punch yourself out. And then, uh-huh. and then what you attach to the opportunity for poise, because ha- showing poise in a conflict gains you admiration and respect probably more than almost anything else. Boy, you were so classy. You, how did, how did mm. you handle it that way? And, and there's a term. You, uh, hold on. Uh, and there's a term called radical patience. So when you say opportunity for poise, exercise radical patience. After you, after you punch yourself out at me in your head, and then, uh, and then during the radical patience, ask yourself, what am I so upset about? You know, why am I so upset again? And uh, so, reach into yourself, figure out what that is, and then, and then ask yourself, what are they upset about? And what are they really upset about? Uh, uh, and how have I actually contributed to what they're upset about? And so that's the opportunity for growth. But if in your mind, uh, and if I do a book, it, I, it, the, I don't know if I have enough information for a book because I think a simple article covering changing your mindset about conflict to it being good and one of your best opportunities for poise and growth. And then this is what it looks like. And then answer the questions. And then the final thing, and this it will probably just be an article, is, uh, and by the way, if you're doing executive coaching or you're listening in and you do executive coaching, one of the ways to tell if someone is coachable is you say to them, so I could say to you, Howie, you got these conflicts. Uh, are you are you interested in doing a better job with them or are you committed to doing a better job with them? Because if you're interested, mm. you'll just nod in agreement and you'll say, you know, that's very interesting, Mark. I might give it a try. And, you know, oh, that's novel. I never thought of it that way. And But the first sign it becomes a little difficult to do that, you'll trash it because you're just interested. But if you're committed, you'll stick to it. 
you'll you'll uh, and you'll modify it. You know, you can get angry at me, but modify. You know, you know, make up your own terms. Opportunity for what in your head? But if you're in the coaching field, one of the ways to tell if someone is coachable is are they committed? You know, and then when you lay into them, uh, if they say, "Yeah, I'm committed," really? Well, here's a way to find out if mm-hmm. you're committed. And by the way, here's something I want to put a plug in for that's free. Uh, in 2015, uh, I created a survey at Harvard Business Review. And you can go there, HBR, Goulston, you'll find it. And it's an assessment. And it's, it's how well do you communicate during conflict? Very simple. I forget how many questions there are. But the modification of it. Uh, and, and it'll say things like, you know, uh, you know, I listen, I fully listen to the other person. I'm when I'm upset, I blah, 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 blah. You know, and it's not rocket science, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm using that now to test the, the, the commitment of clients. I say, uh, I want you to give this, uh, this assessment to your stakeholders uh, uh, about how you. they see you, about you. So it, it, it's, yeah. a, it's an interesting stakeholder thing. So if you think about it, you know, with anybody you have a conflict with, and if you look at the 10 or 12 questions, you say, whoa, that is really daunting. Well, of course it's daunting, but the point is it gives you something to talk about. You know, uh, uh, oh, you see me uh, like mm-hmm. I, I, that I nearly always interrupt when we're having a conversation, we're upset. You seem always never letting you finish, you know, so it's a, a yeah. so I use that to, to test someone's commitment because coachability is all about their commitment to doing things that are difficult and sustaining it past the novelty and past the point when people get off their back about they have to change because those other people are focused on something else. And, uh, you know, without real commitment, people are not coachable. Gotcha. So I I want to go back to the second step, which is after you repeat half-heartedly or grudgingly opportunity for poise, opportunity for growth, then to lash out at you. What's the function of that? Because that's kind of... The opposite, where, where typically I want to tell people to identify that voice and externalize it, to, to you know, defuse from the voice that says, I'm not going to do this, people are stupid, right, to see that as external. But you're doing something different. You're, you're asking the person to align with that voice against you, and it sounds mm-hmm. like it's a prerequisite for them to be able to do these high-level very mature cognitive types of questions that follow. So explain that. Well, it's a little bit like uh, giving them a little psychedelic because in a sense, instead of trying to come off as rational and whatever, uh, I'm inviting them to, in their mind, lash out at me, not at themselves, not at anyone else, but when they lash out at me, and I say, really get into it. Uh, uh, what happens is it, it gets it off their chest safely. Uh, I'll share an intervention with you that I hope will make you chuckle. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's the use of paradox. Uh, so I can remember years ago, there was a, 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 a parent, a mother who was having trouble with her teenage uh, son especially their junior year in high school. And it was really important. And the kid was beginning to flake out. The kid was beginning to, you know, not pay attention to things. And every time she would, uh, uh, you know, get, talk to him about it, he'd get all agitated. And, he, uh, and he'd say, uh, just leave me alone. I, I'll, I'll get to it. You know, just leave me, get on my back, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and so the term for what I'm about to, Express is, and you'll probably know it, is mediated catharsis. So when you safely enable someone else to have a catharsis, it gets stuff off their chest. 
So what I told her to do <laughs> is knock on your son's door and say, can I come in? And they'll probably say, okay, what is this? Uh, and then, and you say, honey, which is going to agitate him. Honey, I'd like you to say the following to me and say it as if you mean it. And he's saying, what? Yeah, you yeah, know, just humor me. Say the following to me. Um, Mom, can you get off my effing back with the homework already? You're such a pain in the ass. The last thing I want to do when you talk to me like this is I'm going to go do video games. I'm going to go watch porn. I, you just get off my effing back already. Will you leave me the F alone? So, honey, could you say that to me? Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he starts to say it. And then I told her when he starts to say it, say, come on, you, you can do better than that. So you're inviting him to punch himself out and he starts to giggle because if he had done that without you mediating the catharsis, you might have reacted. Now, you better calm down and be more respectful. But what you're doing is you're draining the abscess. That's a little bit of surgical empathy. So he's going to start giggling. And what's going to happen? See, here's something that uh, teenagers have taught me over the years. They said, I remember one teenager said, the only thing I hate more than my parents is hating them. You know, they hmm. enrage me so much <laughs> that, it, that it's chilling. And, you know, and I, you know, they make me crazy. I want to punch a wall. And, uh, and they don't know what to do with it. But by mediating their catharsis, inviting them to punch themselves out, they not only start giggling, they are grateful to you because you have enabled them to safely get it all off their chest. You know, come on, you can do better than that. Mm. I mean, you're not telling them to punch you. Oh, come on. Yeah. You're so holding back. So you're... <laughs> all right. You got rubber tipped swords. You're doing... Uh live action role play rather than the real swords that you're accidentally cutting each other with because you're sort of withholding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's wonderful. That's, that's a great uh, Jedi mind trick. I'll give you another mm -hmm. Jedi one, which I give to entrepreneurs for their marriages, because a lot of entrepreneurs are a little bit too alpha for intimacy. Uh, hmm. And, and what I'm, suggesting they do with their spouses. And again, sometimes the entrepreneur is the, dr the woman who's driven. You know, you and I know some of these women who are just driven. I mean, they're, they're the alpha part of the couple. Uh, and, and so the homework I'm giving them is uh, go to your spouse, if you're that alpha person, and say, uh, can I ask you a few things? And, and again, they may be a little bit cautious or parent what and then you look at them and say uh have i ever made you feel that you weren't worth my undivided attention and interest they're gonna go what say so, have i ever made you feel that you weren't worth my undivided attention and interest and in all likelihood they're gonna say yeah and then the second question is at its worst how bad can that get for you? Pretty bad. Then you say, take me to the last time I did that. When you wanted my undivided attention and there was no way you were going to get it. And then you get them to share that incident with you. And when they share it, they refeel it. You don't take issue with it at all. Uh, and you own And you own it. And you say, I did that. You deserve better than that. I'm going to fix it. Mm. I'm sorry. And I was wrong. That's a Jedi move. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so let me, let me tell you about one of my challenges with doing stuff like this. And I love the theoretical um, part of me, like I am a coach. I've spent mm -hmm. years studying human psychology, motivation, communication. And one of my worst tricks that I will play on the people I love 
is to demand that they speak skillfully to me. <laughs> right? So I could see myself going up to a member of my family and asking them a form of that question. And they're not going to do it right. They're going to, they're going to make you statements instead of I statements. And I am going to now, instead of me being like, now I want to teach them how to talk rather than expanding my capacity to listen to imperfect speech. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, see, if you use the word, we'll talk offline because I think the world of you, Howie, and if I can help you, we'll be friends after this, if you want to be. <laughs> uh, um, when you use, uh, that's why I kind of like my wife when she says, don't try that psychological BS on me. I mean, she's, she's just real. <laughs> and my kids, they've all, they're grown, they have each other's back, they've done well. I mean, they're all a little bit more tightly wound than I am. Uh, but, uh, you know, I wish they were more relaxed. But if I use words like skillfully, if I use anything that sounds like jargon, mm. my, my family is going to rip me a new one. And, the, and, and, the, and, and, I, and in my mind, I can say, oh, they're so uncouth. They're so, and, and what I'm realizing is, no, I'm being pedantic. I'm being, uh, uh, because I'm nervous about conflict, uh, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to put lipstick on a pig <laughs> and I can see, I can see uh, Russia from here, but that's another story. But, uh, uh, cause Sarah Palin said that. And so I think, and, and so we can talk about this offline, but I know at times when I am trying to talk sort of clinically what I am trying to do is I'm trying to keep a lid on my Jungian shadow of rage. So inside, mm. every, inside everybody is a Jungian shadow. It's the part of our personality that we don't want to admit to ourselves. We try not to show to the world, and yet everyone has it. And, uh, and, and admitting it to ourselves runs the risk of triggering shame in us. So... so and, and the more you can get in touch with it, but not act on it, you're good to go. So even though people don't experience me this way, and I'm not consciously aware of it, you know, I've got a, I've got a full piano keyboard of my Jungian shadow, self-pity, grudge holding, chip on my shoulder, unforgiving. I get the whole shooting thing. But as long as I don't act on it, I'm good to go. And I realize everybody's got it. Whereas... If there's mm -hmm. something that seems really unseemly about having it, you know, you can you can spend an enormous amount of energy to put a lid on the fact that uh, uh, I really hate someone right now that I love. What is wrong with me? Yeah. I'm a sicko. Whereas what I yeah. say is, yeah. well, there I go. Uh, uh, well, just don't act on it. It's okay to hate them. You know you love them. <laughs> so it's okay to hate them. You know, uh, uh, don't try and talk yourself out of it. You know, you'll get exhausted and you'll probably compensate by eating a whole pizza. So, you know, you know, just, uh, you know as long as you're not, not acting on it, uh, uh, let it go. And uh, yeah, I, I love the, I love the work of, uh, of Stephen Hayes on this around, you know, his, his act, which is to then say, you know, to, to kind of come up with an and, because like we always want to do the bike. I love them, but I can't stand them. He says, well, I love them, and sometimes I can't stand them. And mm -hmm. just ma being okay, making room for the shadow piece, for the voice that we didn't choose, that we don't have to, we can own it without feeling guilty for its existence. Mm -hmm. um, to, be able, to be able to say, you know, I contain multitudes. And, you know, like I said, whenever the shadow um, is un is not visible to us. We're not aware of it. It's probably, first of all, we're acting out of it. And second of all, everybody can see it. It's not, it's not yeah. right. We, we, we show like, it's like, if I'm trying to hide something behind my back, really, obviously, like that's where everybody looks. Yeah. So I'll share something and we're running out of time. Cause as I mentioned, uh, I have to run to something. Uh, one of the things I try to help people get to and, and they run away from it is, pure, just pure hurt. And one of the reasons people run away from it mm. is they 
feel if I show pure hurt to someone and uh, as opposed to my defense against the hurt, which is anger and irritability, what I'm afraid of it is if I really showed them what I was really hurt about, they wouldn't care at all. And then how do I stay in the relationship? Mm. So, so I'll hold it back. And again, this is all unconscious. But uh, uh, but there there have been times with my wife when I'll say, you, you know how we when we get back at each other and all this sort of thing? And I'll say, you know, I, I said this to her some years ago. I said, there's a, there's a pretty high number of people in the world who trust me, have confidence in me, admire me, respect me, like me. And the person I want it most from and often get at least from is you. And I haven't been honest with you because I'm not angry about it. I'm hurt. Deeply hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's always been, and my wife's wonderful. I mean, she'll say, she'll say, uh, well, well, I'm a warrior and I take my worries out on you. You know, if I'm worried about the kids, I take it out on you. If I'm worried about money, I take it out on you. And I said, you don't have to change. I just have to be honest. I said, what it comes down to mm. is if it's important to you, you won't change. You have to care enough about it. But I didn't do this for you to change. I did this because I wanted you to know that I'm not angry at you. I've never been angry at you, ever, even though I can act a little bit snippy. But what I have been is hurt when I don't feel appreciated, when I feel you know, yada, yada, yada. And, but I'll tell you, when I went through those layers, Howie, and I said, I'm not angry at you. I've never been angry at you. I'm hurt. Mm. Can you feel the power of that quiet power and the honesty. And, and, and it was like, a, it was like a, you know, it was like a gorilla was lifted off my back. I just felt great. It was like, ah, oh, I feel terrific. I felt so terrific. I said, I feel so terrific. You can lay into me again. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think it's key that you said, I feel hurt as opposed to you hurt me. That's right. Right. And so that, you, that, that when when we when we ex, when we show ownership, it, it it even if the other person isn't skillful, they can feel that, that we're not trying to make them wrong. Right. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I have to get somewhere. Uh, so maybe we'll do a part two if people want to hear more of my blithering. I, I would I would love to do a part two. This has been beautiful for me. First of all, you know, as I said before, we started recording. I've, there's a lot that I need around this topic. So I've been sort of doing stealth therapy while conducting the conversation. Um, how, just before you go, where can people find you and follow you? So uh, I have a podcast, uh, which Howie and uh, Peter Bregman were on called My Wake Up Call. Uh, so you can get that wherever you find your podcasts. And it's in 40 countries. Um, it's uh, it's in the top 0.5% of podcasts. And we've had notable people ranging from uh, Howie and Peter to Jordan Peterson to Larry King to uh, uh, to Norman Lear to Ken Blanchard. So I hope people will. And the conversations are like this. I mean, even though they're my guests, we just get into it. So if if you like the feel of this, check out my wake up call. And then my website is markgoulston.com. And if you go to LinkedIn, I, you know, I keep that relatively current. Plus we've started something on LinkedIn called 90 second mentor in which we, uh, we take sound bites from some of the more prominent thought leaders that we've had on like Susan Cain, Daniel Pink, uh, uh, Marshall Goldsmith, and we just share a little nugget that you can think about for the day. It's, it's very short. It's called 90 mm -hmm. Second Mentor. Great. And I'll include links to all that in the show notes for today's episode. But I want to make sure we get you to your next appointment on time so that you'll want to come back. So, Dr. Mark Goulston, thank you so much for your, your career of work and for your generosity and for your time today. 
And I'll leave you with this, and I'll leave your listeners with you. Howie, just because you got a lot of rage inside you doesn't mean you're not a mensch. <laughs> we all, <laughs> have, you know, we, uh, as long as we don't act on it, uh, sometimes, sometimes just uh, accept, you know, accepting the dark side and realizing everybody has it can free us. But uh, to be continued for our, on our next episode. All right. Mark, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you, Howie.